Um, so what uh, what I propose to uh, talk about today is a is a topic. Um, I'm going to share my screen just so you can see my PowerPoint. And um, I will say that um, Amanda also has a copy of this PowerPoint. So um, if there there's a lot of material you can see on here about 87 slides, um, which I know I'm not going to get to everything. I'm going to try to do my best. Um, but if there are things that I cover or rush through or don't get to, I'm very happy for Amanda to um, share with you um, and, uh, and also happy to take questions afterwards. So my plan is uh, to speak for about the next 45 minutes and then um, we'll have time for Q&A uh, towards the end of my presentation this morning. Um, and we'll leave about 20 minutes. And if you do have questions, just feel free to put those in the chat box and, um, and as I go, and I'll respond to them towards the end of, uh, of my talk this morning. So um, as, as Amanda said, I, I teach uh, Judaic studies and I teach modern Jewish history, and I've done a lot of work on Jewish responses to the Holocaust, um, not just teaching the history of the Holocaust, but teaching very specifically on the ways in which Jews responded to persecution before, during, and after the war, including quite a bit of work on Jewish life in the aftermath of the war among survivors in the DP camps and in the decades after the end of the war. And one of the most effective ways that I have found um, to engage with students on uh, the history of the Holocaust and the perspective of the individual through the war is um, by teaching about sources that we would call Holocaust literature. And in a few minutes, I'll give you a specific definition of what I refer to as Holocaust literature. But before I get into that, I think one of the things that's important for us to understand is, and I think all of you know this challenge, is how to convey the enormity of what we refer to as the Holocaust, the enormity of the destruction of European Jewry in a very limited time period. Um, and I know that this ends up being one of the major challenges that teachers confront because no matter whether you have uh, a day, a week, a month, a full semester, a full year to cover a topic, it's never enough time. Um, and so one of the challenges is how do you how do you introduce students to the subject? How do you convey it um, in a limited period of time? And what I'd like to do is introduce you to um, some sources that probably many of you are familiar with. I'm sure many people have used Elie Wiesel's Night before, but also some sources that you perhaps uh, have not seen before. I'm gonna switch over to um, slideshow mode here. Okay. Um, so Elie Wiesel um, in his the 1986 uh, Nobel Prize lecture articulated one of the challenges that um, survivors confronted both during and after the war. On the one hand, the uh, obligation to write and record the experiences that Jews underwent over the course of the war was a sense of obligation to write and record both the enormity of what they were undergoing, the unbelievable circumstances that they were forced to encounter, the sorts of things that no one would believe they were forced to encounter if they did not uh, write and record it. There was, as Elie Wiesel referred to, and you can see her in the bold print, a supreme duty towards memory, a supreme duty towards memory, a sense of an obligation, uh, a commandment to remember. So on the one hand, we can see Wiesel trying to grapple with this commandment to remember an obligation that they felt both to those who had not survived and an obligation that they felt to communicate to the future, to future generations. As he wrote, the survivors wanted to communicate everything to the living, the victim's solitude and sorrow, the tears of mothers driven to madness, the prayers of the doomed beneath a fiery sky. But as he also suggested, one of the challenges in communicating the suffering uh, that was experienced during the war was that language, language, that tool that we use to communicate was insufficient to communicate the enormity of the trauma, the enormity of the destruction that was experienced. If language failed 
Jews in the time of the war to be able to articulate that which they experienced. All the more so think about from the perspective of both Jews writing in the time of the war and Jews trying to communicate through language after the war what they experienced, the enormous chasm that it would exist between people who had undergone this experience and the inability to use language to communicate that experience to those who were not there. So Wiesel, you can see here, is talking about this challenge. On the one hand, feeling an obligation to communicate. On the other hand, talking about the inability of language to communicate. And we will see this articulated repeatedly in a number of the sources that I'm gonna share with you today. A sense that we have a commandment and obligation to communicate and a sense that language will never be able to articulate that which we experience. And yet you can feel the urgency, the need, the obligation to communicate this. Um, one of the challenges for teachers in teaching about the history of the Holocaust and for that matter of genocide and any traumatic experiences that we think about that we want to communicate to our students is how do we convey for students the scope and the enormity of these historical events? In the case of the Holocaust, how do we convey for students the scope and the enormity of the Holocaust while pres preserving the perspective of the individual? We often grapple with this question of six million, right? We think about the destruction of European Jewry. We think about the idea that two out of every three Jews living on the European continent before World War II were destroyed, right? We think about the destruction of a civilization. How do you convey the destruction of a civilization? How do you grapple with the enormity, the scope and enormity of this event while also preserving the perspective of the individual, right? It is an enormous challenge. How do you teach about the size of it? And we could think about, there's all sorts of attempts with sort of counting projects. I won't get into that to think about, to have students think about uh, the number 6 million, while also not losing sight of the perspective of the individual. And not just the 6 million Jews, but think about the millions of other victims and the tens of millions killed over the course of the Second World War, 55 million killed. I mean, these are huge numbers, right? to a point where it becomes almost impossible to convey to the student the enormity of the catastrophe, right? This is when people think about, here we are living 75 years after the end of the Second World War. This is an enormous catastrophe in history that continues to echo and resonate until the present day. And so there is this obligation to continue to teach about it and we can't wrap our heads around it, but yet we feel an obligation to do so. So how do we communicate the experience of the individual? Well, I would argue that literature and good teaching through literature can be one of the key tools that we can use to communicate, to teach this, to convey the perspective of the individual. Through literature, the act of writing, right? Writing by an individual, the act of an individual who picks up a pen, a pencil, puts it to paper, right? This is an individual act. And if you can communicate to your students that this is a way where we get the perspective of the individual, the solitary perspective, writing that is deeply personal, writing that observes or documents or fulfills the obligation of memory, or that helps us to remember something we personally never experienced, writing and literature may help us to overcome this challenge. Think about this idea of when we say to students, remember, right? How do you remember something you never experienced? You can't remember something you never experienced. Wiesel talks about the obligation of memory. Wiesel talks about memories that will never leave him. Lem memories that on the one hand he wants to forget, memories that on the other hand he feels obligated to share and to remember. How can we even engage in that sort of perspective taking? Well, through reading, his words or the words of others, survivors, the words of those who wrote during the war, the words of those who kept diaries, we can begin to take that perspective, right? We want our students to develop empathy, to understand what it's like to stand in the shoes of the other. Literature has the power to do this in a way that few other sources can. Um, and I think, and I'll, I'll try to get to this by the end of my talk today, when I think about literature, I mean, I think,
for our students today, we can also think about using film and video and thinking about it as a type of text, right? You still have to write the text. You still have to communicate the perspective of those that we see on screen, both in documentary and in feature format. And if it's done well, right? Film can also be a very effective tool to help students develop empathy, to help students appreciate the, exp the experience of the other, to help transport them through time, to sort of engage in this time of type of time travel that they want, we want them to do to understand and to learn history. So both fiction and nonfiction can give us the unique perspective of the individual and convey the depth of human emotion. And I would say that this issue of conveying the depth of human emotion is, is one of the major challenges that we have to try to confront when we use literature as a teaching tool. Because very often, and I'm guilty of this all the time, I am a historian by training. And as a historian, I will read diaries. I will read documents created by the war. I will read sources for historical value. I'm looking for dates. I'm looking for events. I'm looking for change over time. I'm looking for ways to teach my students, see, you could, they document that this happened. This is proof that this event happened. And we're gonna use this as a source, right? As sort of our evidence, as our proof. One of the challenges that we have to maintain when we use diaries or when we use memoirs is to not just think about the documentation that the source conveys, but the emotion that the source conveys. Think about Wiesel's words there where he talks about the inability of language to communicate the depth of the trauma. We think about the traumatized individuals who are still trying to use language, putting pen to paper to convey the depth of the traumatic experiences that they endured. And we have to bear that in mind when we read these sources, right? We can't just use them as sort of factual pieces of information for the teaching of history. We also have to use them to understand the depth of human emotion, right? And that's one of the challenges that we confront when using uh, these, these sources. All right, so um, by way of starting, I like to start with uh, this poster. Um, sorry, I can't, let me move my bar here at the top so I could see what you see. Okay, so I wanna start by using this poster. This is a poster that was created um, in the displaced persons camps by uh, Holocaust survivors in the immediate aftermath of the war. Um, in the aftermath of the war, uh, after the liberation of the concentration camps in Germany in the summer of 1945, um, so when the camps were first liberated in April, May of 1945, there were approximately 50,000 Jews uh, liberated uh, mainly in Bavaria, but also in other parts of Germany. And over the course of the next two years, uh, probably another 150,000 Jews who had survived the war in Eastern Europe and in the far reaches of the Soviet Union streamed into the DP camps, the displaced persons camps of uh, Germany. And there we see historical commissions that attempted to create the first efforts to document what had happened during the war. So this is a poster that's created by one of the historical commissions in the American zone, occupation zone of Germany. And you can see on this poster, an attempt by the historical commission to try to uh, convince survivors to engage in the act of remembering, both collective remembering and uh, individual remembering. Now, if we were normally in our classroom, I would turn this into an interactive portion of my talk and I'd be asking you to identify the things that you can see on this poster and we talk about what's on the poster, but in the, in the Zoom format, it's a little harder to do that. So I'm gonna zoom in, uh, pun intended, I guess. Um, I'm gonna zoom in here and um, I want you to look at the poster and I'm gonna tell you the different parts of what uh, the Historical Commission is asking survivors to do on this poster. So right here at the very top, um, I'm not sure if you can see my uh, cursor or not. Um, right here at the very top in the red letters, there are, um, this is written both in Hebrew at the top, biblical Hebrew, and then the poster also uses Yiddish and cursive writing at the bottom. So at the top it says, 
Zachor et asher asalacha Amalek. Remember what Amalek did unto thee. And this is actually written very specifically in the text that is used in the writing of the Torah scrolls. So remember what Amalek did unto thee. This is a biblical imperative that is enjoined upon the children of Israel after the exodus from Egypt. The idea that there is a tribe of Amalekites that tried to destroy the children of, of Israel after the exodus from Egypt. And Moses is told, and the children of Israel are told, Zachor et aser, asher asalacha Amalek. Remember what Amalek did unto you. This is one of the most important commandments in Judaism. The commandment to Zachor, to remember, is repeated uh, up to 200 times in the Hebrew Bible. The Jewish people are commanded to remember all sorts of things, but the commandment to remember that there was a group of people that tried to destroy you, right, is also important for the Jewish people. So on the one hand, we have this Zachor et asher asalacha Amalek that goes back to biblical times. And then on the bottom, uh, we see the skeleton, who is a symbol of uh, death, right? Pointing to, in cursive writing, Zamult und collect and record. And under, you can see where the skeleton is pointing to, under there, this poster, you can see the number six million. And behind the six million, you can see, so there is a quill, which I have to remind students or students have no idea that this is a ancient writing implement, not that ancient, but people used to write with quills. Um, and behind it, you have pages of testimony. So you have this sense among survivors that they had an obligation to the six million to write and to record, to write the names of those who died, to write the names of those who perished. So you have this sort of time travel that's taking place in the biblical sense, the obligation to remember, remember the destruction, write it down so it's not forgotten. If you write it down, you will both remember what they tried to do and you will blot out the memory of the evildoers by writing down and recording and remembering those who were destroyed. Now what's happening in the middle? So in the middle, you can see that we have the hands of time. And of course, this marks the passage of time. On the one hand, there is a, a, an awareness amongst the survivors and those who organized the historical commission, survivors themselves, that time was passing. And think about it, in 1947, they're saying to survivors, you have to write and record your memories now, two years after the war. Here we are 75 years after the war, thinking about how we're going to remember the Holocaust when there are no more survivors. Two years after the war, they're saying, write it down now, remember, record it before you forget it. This could be our last chance to record it. And they also embed something beautiful here in the middle, in the passage of time, which is there are these other historical events from Jewish history, starting actually here, I guess, in the top left corner would be chronologically the first event the uh, slavery in Egypt, you can see these pyramids. And how did the Jewish people remember slavery in Egypt? They wrote it down. This is the Passover Haggadah, Haggadah Shel Pesach. And it's told and retold every year on the Passover holiday. How do you remember that you were once a people who were enslaved? How do you appreciate freedom? You write it and you tell it and you retell it. And then you go here in just a few weeks, We'll mark uh, Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, the holiday that recalls the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And here you can see the destroyed temple. It says Chorban Habayit, the destruction of the temple, the menorah that's upside down. You could see a little bit of the last remaining wall here. And you can see the scroll, the book of Lamentations called Echa, right? This helps us to remember, right? It helps us to lament the destruction of the temple. Same thing down here. Gerush Svarad, the expulsion from Spain. And we have this book, Emek Abacha, which is written after the expulsion from Spain. And again, bottom left corner, the middle of the 17th century, Gzerot Tach Vetat. These were called the Chmelnitsky massacres that took place in 1648 and 49. Until then, the largest destruction of mass killing of over 100,000 Jews that took place in uh, present day Ukraine. 
right? How do we remember? We have this book, Yevin Mitzula. So you could see this powerful invocation after the war. How do you remember? You remember by writing. You remember by recording for future generations. You perform this sacred sense of obligation to those who did not survive, right? Here's the obligation to death. You perform the obligation of memory and you have to write it and record it. And there's also this sense that is conveyed here, right? This destruction that the Jewish people have just endured, this chorban, as it was referred to in Yiddish, chorban, we use in English the word Holocaust, which is a translation that comes from the Septuagint from Greek, literally means Holocaust, burnt and whole. We have the Hebrew Shoah, which means destruction. And in Yiddish, the survivors would use the term Chorban, the destruction, because we had the destruction of the first temple, the destruction of the second temple, and this was the third destruction, the third Chorban. And this also conveyed a sense that this is not the first time in history that the Jewish people have endured a destruction. They have survived other destructions. They have written it, they have recorded it, and we will survive this one and we will remember it for the future. And this is a core part of performing the act of Jewish memory through literature. I could spend the whole 45 minutes on this poster, but I'll, I'll move on. Um, so, and again, here's the biblical verse uh, where we get the sense of the obligation of memory. So, we think about how important it is to remember. We think about survivors trying to perform this um, sort of uh, commandment to remember. But we also have to think about when we teach it, that while we are communicating and engaging in this act of the obligation, the sacred nature of memory, we also have to think about, right, what do we want our students to remember? Why are we teaching them this, right? Learning is memory. Right? Learning is engaging in the process of, of memory making and, and using memory for the purpose of learning as well. Um, what is it that we want them to remember? Right? And we think about the tools that we have at our disposal to help people remember. Um, as Wiesel said, and here you can see him at the opening of the Holocaust Museum in Washington in 1993, for the dead and the living, we must bear witness, this sacred obligation to remember, remember for the past, remember for the present, remember for the future. So now I promised that I would um, give you a definition of what I mean when I talk about Holocaust literature. And this comes from uh, a book by David Roskies and Nomi Diamant called Holocaust Literature. Um, it's a wonderful collection that also has excellent tools and curricular tools for how to teach about the Holocaust using literature. And uh, Roskies and Diamant use this definition, Holocaust literature comprises all forms of writing, both documentary and discursive, and in any language that have shaped the public memory of the Holocaust and been shaped by it. Now this is a very broad definition, and it's intentionally broad because when we start to think about what we would define in this category of what is Holocaust literature, you can see all of the different types of material that fall under this category of Holocaust literature. We have material that's created during the war, we have material that's created in the immediate aftermath of the war, and we have material that's being written today that we will put into this category of Holocaust literature. So we have diaries, which I'll talk about in a moment, not just the diary of Anne Frank, um, which is the most famous and most popularly used uh, source for the teaching of the Holocaust, but other diaries that I would argue are, are even more useful to convey the depth and the enormity of the destruction from the perspective of those who experienced it. But when we use a diary, again, we have to ask this question, right? Who is it written for? A diary by definition is a very personal source. It is a very personal document. Diaries are generally written for an audience of one. So when we use a diary, we have to think about, right? Was the, aud was the writer writing it for an audience of one, meaning herself or himself? Or was the diary writer thinking about the perspective of the future? 
thinking about how am I going to save this document? What do I want to convey? And then go back to this question that we raised before about the inability of language to convey the traumatic nature of the events. Can the diary writer actually use language to convey the enormity of what they're experiencing? Right? So we'll look at a couple of sources that fall into this category of diaries or journals. Documentation efforts fall into this uh, literature category, and I'll talk about some of those. Attempts to purely preserve material and document, right? Think about journalistic recording. Think about newspaper writing. Think about uh, it recording interviews and testimonies from the time of the war to make sure that they are preserved, to make sure that people know what is happening. Of course, memoirs that are written in the immediate aftermath of the war. But memoirs have the same question. Who is the memoir written for? Am I writing it for my family? Am I writing it for myself as a process, a cathartic process, treatment? Am I writing it for a broad, massive, popular audience? What language am I writing it in? Am I writing it in my own language? Am I self-translating, right? Um, you know, those are all questions that we have to ask when we think about how to use memoirs. I wanna look at some examples of poetry, both written during and after the war. Poetry is an amazing source to use where you can communicate to your students how in a minimal number of words, you can convey the great depth of human emotion, right? We talked about screenplays and film as a type of writing. Journalism and newspaper created during the war as a type of writing. Music, poetry put to music as another type. And then um, I'll give some examples of novels at the end. Um, okay. So at the same time, right, we're left with this question um, that Theodore Adorno po poses for us, which is, you know, what are the ethical boundaries of creating culture? You know, is it, is it, is it indeed barbaric to write a poem after Auschwitz, right? Or, and here I would say that Adorno might be thinking about this from a German perspective, right? From a German perspective, um, to write a poem after Auschwitz is barbaric. From a German perspective, to try to elevate German culture and to say the Germans were a cultured and civilized people who could descend to the depths of human evil, perhaps he's suggesting that to write a poem after Auschwitz is barbaric. From the perspective of the victims, it's a completely different encounter, right? It's not barbaric at all. It is not only a cultural critique, it is a form of resistance, right? To maintain one's humanity under conditions of complete dehumanization. Writing and preserving and creating, doing the things that only humans can do, this is a type of resistance, right? creating literature under these conditions. Um, and the truth is that through this, not only do we resist the perpetrators, do we resist the evil, do we resist the evil impulse that exists in human beings to destroy civilization, we preserve civilization and cre we create a new civilization, right? The possibilities to overcome the depths of human evil. All right. So I, I want to take you through now a few of the different types of sources. Um, I'm, I want to try to get to as many different things as I can. So um, I'm going to zoom through a number of different things as, as I go. So the first source that I want to talk about is um, sources that are created in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, now you can see here, this is a, a map of the Warsaw Ghetto, um, the boundaries of the ghetto after it's sealed in November of 1940. Just to give you some context, the war breaks out September 1st, 1939. Um, by uh, the fall of 1940, there are about 500,000 Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto, um, which makes it the largest ghetto uh, in Europe. There were, by, by some counts, over a thousand ghettos that were created in Eastern Europe, small ghettos and small towns and medium-sized ghettos and, and towns and cities. The Warsaw Ghetto was the largest ghetto, which is 
one of the reasons that there's so much focus on the Warsaw Ghetto, that and the revolt um, also draws a lot of attention to Warsaw. But in the ghetto, in the Warsaw Ghetto, where we have 500,000 Jews crowded into this tiny area, where you can see uh, this is about 2% of the total area of the city of Warsaw. And Jews were one third of the city's population was crowded into 2% of, of the city, right? So it gives you a sense for the levels of overcrowding that they would have had in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, disease, we think about the spread of epidemics, right? Think about um, the spread of disease that would have taken place in this incredibly crowded urban area. Hunger and starvation were a daily battle. P people were grabbed off the streets for forced labor. Thousands of people were dying each month. This was before the summer of 1942 when they started mass deportations uh, to, to Treblinka. But under these conditions in the Warsaw Ghetto, we have literature that is being created that um, documents the experiences. And so one of the most valuable sources that we have um, for experiences of Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto is that uh, underground archive that is created by Emanuel Ringelblum. Um, you can see here his dates, 1940 to 1944. Ringelblum, I, I'm guessing that many of you by now have seen the um, documentary film that came out, I believe it's about two years ago now, Who Will Write Our History, um, that's based here. You can see the, the wonderful book by Samuel Cassow, um, uh, Who Will Write Our History. Um, Cassow wrote this uh, tremendous book, both about Emanuel Ringelblum and about his uh, underground archive in the Warsaw Ghetto that was called the Oinig Shabbos Archive. Um, and there's a documentary film that came out two years ago. If you haven't seen it, I would highly, highly recommend it. It's excellent. Um, what Ringelblum resolved to do once he saw the conditions of the war and the creation of the ghetto was to collect and record right? To write and record as much as he could of what was happening in the ghetto. Because he knew, on the one hand, for the purposes of documentation, no one would ever believe what the Jews were experiencing. And that if the Germans won the war, he was a historian, he was a teacher, he was a social welfare activist, he was politically involved. He knew that if the Germans won the war, Victors write the history, and no one would ever know the history of the Jewish people. No one would ever know what had happened in the ghetto. And so he assembles this team, 25 underground workers, working in secret to document everything as much as they could, to collect scraps of paper, to collect newspapers, to interview refugees who had been brought in from the provinces to the ghetto, to collect artwork, to collect poetry, anything that they could even photographs that became part of the underground archive. And Casa writes about this beautifully in the book and it's covered beautifully in the film. So we can see this imperative to write and record, you know, lit using pen and paper as a type of resistance, right? Creating time capsules that would be buried underground for future generations to uncover, right? This is one of the milk cans. Um, there's one in Warsaw and there's one in Washington, one of these, these two milk cans that were recovered after the war, um, where they just put in scraps of paper and whatever was in the archive and buried it underground. Um, and there were also 10 metal boxes uh, that were recovered after the war. You saw Ringelblum's dates there. Um, Ringelblum did not survive till the end of the war. Uh, he survived the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. He was uh, taken to a, a a forced labor camp. Um, he was smuggled out of that camp and back to Warsaw and was eventually uh, captured uh, due to an informant um, who raided their bunker and found their hiding place outside Warsaw and he was killed in 1944. I mentioned there were 25 people who were part of this underground archive. Only two of them survived till the end of the war. Um, two of the main activists. One was Hirsch Wasser, the other was Rochel Auerbach. And thanks to them, we were able to find, they were able to find the materials that they had hidden in these time capsules underground. So we know a lot of what happened. One of the activists in the underground archive was a rabbi by the name of Shimon Huberband, 
Shimon Huberband was interested in a number of things about Jewish experiences during the war, in the, in the Warsaw Ghetto in particular. He wanted to know about religious life. You know, how, how are Jews who need to pray three times a day and need to organize prayer services and great rabbis and Hasidic rabbis, how are they sustaining their communities under these circumstances, right? How do you explain what is happening under the circumstances? How do you explain from the theological perspective what's happening? So he wrote about everything that he could about religious life in the Warsaw Ghetto. We know so much because of what he wrote. There's a volume called Kiddush Hashem, the sanctification of God's name, uh, that, that is a collection of his writings that survived the war about religious life um, in, in the Warsaw Ghetto. He was also interested in uh, preserving folklore. He wrote down jokes that people told in the ghetto, right? Um, you know, everything, this is literature too, right? So for example, a joke that was, that's in Hubert Ben's collection that was going around uh, the Warsaw ghetto. They, they go to a, a young boy by the name of Moshe and uh, they, they say, Moshe, tell me, Moshe, what would you wanna be if you were Hitler's son? And he thinks for a second and he says, an orphan, right? This was a joke that was being told in the Warsaw Ghetto, right? Um, that's important to record that. We know we can see this sort of use of humor as a type of resistance, right? Humor that is a weapon, humor that usually involves Hitler dying in the end, right? There's a lot of jokes like that. Um, so, and we have all sorts of materials that document social welfare efforts in the, in the Warsaw Ghetto that were preserved um, as well. And then we have diaries. Um, and so one of the, the sort of um, most famous diaries to emerge from the Warsaw Ghetto was a diary of a, of a rabbi and a teacher and a principal by the name of Chaim Kaplan, who um, kept an excellent uh, diary uh, of his experiences, very insightful writer. So um, my colleague, Ali Garbarini, the, the nice thing about being at home as I can pull books off my shelf. And so Ali Garbarini writes about um, Chaim Kaplan's uh, diary in her book, Number Days, Diaries in the Holocaust. And one of the, the um, you know, in his diary, we see him recording the experiences of Jews living in the ghetto. And so for example, when he finds out that the Warsaw Ghetto is going to be sealed, he writes down in his diary this sort of, um, the way in which the Jewish masses tried to make sense of and explain what was happening. This is October 14th, 1940 diary entry. This is a month before the ghetto is sealed. It's on the holiday of Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the Jewish year, when the Nazis, and they always did this to ruin the holidays, sort of make the news known that the ghetto will be sealed a month later. A rumor is spreading among the people, he wrote, that in one of the minyanim, one of the prayer quora, the prayer leader dressed in his white robe, Kittel, prepared to lead a poor and downtrodden congregation uh, in the closing Yom, Yom Kippur service when a young man dashed into the minyan and brought news of the closing of the ghetto. Immediately the same Jew refused to pray, removed his robe and returned to his place. One cannot pray when our prayers are forsaken. He who hears our prayers has closed the gates of compassion. Why should we lie to ourselves? I am not sure that this is exactly what happened, but if the people invented such a rumor, it is a sign that this could be true. Since the masses began to think heretical thoughts, one should note the number of unbelievers and heretics has grown among the people of Israel. Okay, and he goes on to talk about his own doubts, right? Even though he maintained his belief, he maintained his faith, it's natural that people would begin to question, right? How could God let this happen? Um, but something that's very interesting, if you use a source like this, is his mention of rumors. Because you think about how does news spread? How does information spread? And how quickly rumors might have spread in the ghetto and how quickly people would grab onto whatever information they could have when they were isolated in ghettos and did not have the information. Um, in the conclusion, of this entry from October 14, 1940. He writes, finally, the ghetto has been created for the people of Israel and Warsaw, a community which totals half a million Jews. This ghetto is a place of refuge for many people. 
a narrow quarter has been allotted, which is destined to become a place for all manners of atrocities and evil deeds. Approximately 1,000 people still live in the Aryan quarter. In the next 20 days, the entire mass of people must uproot themselves from their apartments, stores, and businesses and come to these narrow, overcrowded streets. In the ghetto, there's not one open corner. There's not an empty crack, not even an occupied hole. They have expelled us from the streets that they walk, once renowned for hundreds of years of Jewish life. Right? And you can see how a ghetto, how, how a diary entry like this will convey some of the elements of this, this news, this shocking news, right? Jews have lived in Warsaw for hundreds of years. This Jewish quarter of Nalevsky, which was the main Jewish quarter in Warsaw, the ghetto has been created around it, right? All of a sudden, we can't walk on that street where Jewish businesses have been for hundreds of years, right? Um, it's very difficult to communicate the shocking nature of this experience, but a diary can, can help in, in communicating that. Um, Adam Chernyakov, who was the um, head of the, the uh, Warsaw Ghetto Judenrat, also kept a diary. He also communicated from his perspective, a very controversial figure, but it's a very interesting source to use, right? What, how, how did the head of the Jewish council write about his decisions? And again, Chernyakov is somebody who would have kept a diary and might have been thinking very clearly about how will history judge me, knowing very well that he's a very controversial figure. And so when you read his diary, you have to think about this question of someone writing a diary that others are going to read, very clearly thinking about how will history judge me. Ringelblum kept a diary too. Um, and here you can see this is from the summer of 1942. After two years in the ghetto, he begins to write about the complete spiritual breakdown that's taking place, right? The disintegration of the community, the dis disintegration of society, the complete demoralization, right? Um, and, you know, how do you convey that? Um, Rachel Auerbach, who I mentioned before, also wrote beautifully about her experiences in a sense, in a way, trying to convey through language that which couldn't be conveyed. Um, David Roski, who I mentioned before, in his volume, The Literature of Destruction, includes many of these sources that I'm talking about and also includes the writings of Rochel Auerbach, um, who tries to convey the enormity, the depth of the destruction that happened in the Warsaw Ghetto. I'm gonna skip ahead in the, in the interests of time, um, Ringelblum there talks about beginning to have the dawning realization, the news that is filtering in through rumors that the Nazis have created extermination camps for the Jews. And the inability to understand, to comprehend that something like this could ever really exist, that there could possibly be a factory that would be created, rumors that are spreading of places where poison gas is pumped in to murder hundreds of people at the same time. It was beyond comprehension at the time, and he writes about that. Um, all right, I, I want to mention sort of this overview of literary sources um, that not only do we have to talk about uh, sources that convey um, sort of the written word, but we can think about art as well. Um, and here I, I include the work of Arthur Schick. Um, if you're not familiar with, with his work, um, Arthur Schick was a Polish Jewish artist who uh, managed to leave Poland in the 1930s, first going to London and then coming to uh, Canada and eventually making his way to New York. And before the United States joined the war in December of 1941, Schick was described as a one-man army, right? He sort of um, resolved to convince Americans that this was their war to fight, that they had an obligation, and he basically used the pen as his weapon, right? As he said, words and pictures are, words and pictures are bullets whose flight never ends. Their trajectory knows no down curve. They endure long after the guns are silenced. But how to use words and pictures to convey uh, the need for Americans to join the war effort. So this is uh, something that was published in Collier's Magazine in 1940, A Madman's Dream. 
um, in which he tried to use his pen and his artwork to convince Americans that they had an obligation to get involved in this war, right? You can see this, that Hitler sitting here in this chair um, with the globe between his legs, the dreams of having a swastika on every continent, right? Global domination, the Jewish Untermensch uh, as the bare rug underneath, Hitler's various uh, lackeys and henchmen, including here in the corner, um, Pierre Laval holding a puppet um, who was supposed to be Marshal Patin, uh, that was supposed to be the Vichy puppet government, right? You sort of see how you can use artwork um, satirically as well. And here you can see Uncle Sam showing up in chains, right? Saying to Americans, this will be your future as well, right? Think about how you can use art um, and literature to convey these types of messages. Um, wonderful as a, as a teaching tool as well. Some people might also be familiar with Schick's um, Passover Haggadah, in which um, he illustrates the four sons. And so you could see sort of his also using this artwork to communicate who is the wise son, who is the wicked son, who is uh, the simple son, and who is the son who does not know how to ask. Um, lots of works by Arthur Schick that are very rich sort of in the, in the medieval tradition of the illustrated manuscript that communicate a great deal. Um, it's not just from the Warsaw Ghetto, we also see the value of literature and diaries from ghettos all over Eastern Europe, um, and also the value of literature for Jews imprisoned in ghettos, right? The fact that reading not only helped them maintain their humanity, but creating literature helped them to not become demoralized. Um, so this was a notice uh, informing that the 100,000th book had been checked out of the ghetto library in Vilna, right? Think about you're in the Vilna ghetto, there's a library that's created to help maintain culture under these circumstances. Um, Hermann Crook kept a diary, uh, which, okay, here's my copy of Crook's diary. It's called The Last Days of the Jerusalem of Lithuania. Um, and uh, this is a very valuable source uh, as well. Um, among those imprisoned in the Vilna ghetto was one of the great poets of uh, the time, a poet by the name of Avram Sutskever, who you can see him here, sitting next to um, also the playwright and writer and musician Shmirka Kaczerginski. Um, and Sutskever, under the conditions of the ghetto, resolved to continue to write poetry, to use poetry to communicate that which he was experiencing in the ghetto. So for example, he wrote a poem um, in September of 1943 about this transformation that needed to take place for the Jews living in the ghetto, Jews who he thought needed to be convinced to engage in resistance, right? And he writes this poem called The Lead Plates at the Rome Press. The Rome Press that was the Rome printing works, which for hundreds of years had been printing holy books, Sifre Kodesh, books that were used by the Jewish people to maintain, you know, the Jewish religion. And he talked about the resistance, the underground, needing to literally try to sneak into the Rome printing works, take the lead plates that would have been used to print out books, melt down the lead from the lead plates and turn them into bullets. And he writes here, a raid at night, like fingers stretched through bars to clit the litter, clutch the litter of freedom. We made for the print for the press plates to seize the lead plates at the Rome printing works. We were dreamers. We had to be soldiers, and melt down for our bullets the spirit of the lead. At some timeless native lair, we unlocked the seal once more, shrouded in shadow by the glow of a lamp, like temple ancients dipping oil into candelabrums of festal gold. So pouring out line after lettered line did we. Letter by melting letter, the lead, liquefied bullets gleamed with thoughts. A verse from Babylon, a verse from Poland, seething, flowing into one mold. Now must Jewish grit, long concealed in words, detonate the world in a shot, right? Think about this symbolic transformation that he's, trying, that he's talking about. Transforming what for the Jewish people has been the lifeblood of the Jewish people, right? the creation of a literature that's literally printed with these lead plates. And then you have to transform this essence of the Jewish people 
into the drive for revenge, right? The drive to fight back. Um, now in Vilna, this never happened. There was no revolt in Vilna. It was, it was not like Warsaw. The, the underground fighters in Vilna were forced to escape from the ghetto and end up joining the partisans, just like Sutzkever did, and fight back from the forest. But this idea that the Jewish people had to transform themselves, right? This poem communicates this beautifully. He, he's got so many poems that are just so deep in terms of, and this is the Yiddish version of the poem. Um, he also wrote about, you know, what will it be like when we finally survive and are liberated, right? How will we fill our goblets on the day of liberation and with what, right? These memories will always be with us, no matter what. We long for liberation, we long for the aftermath of the war, but we'll never be able to celebrate it. Um, some of you might be familiar with a poem that um, in Yiddish is called Unter deine weiße Sterren, Under your white stars in which Sutzkever wrote about um, this, beneath the whiteness of your stars, he wrote to God, stretch out toward me your white hand. All my words are turned to tears. They long to rest within your hand. See their brilliant light goes darker in my eyes grown cellar dim, and I lack a quiet corner from which to send them back again. Yet, O oh Lord, all my desire to leave you with my wealth of tears in me there burns an urgent fire, and in the fire there burn my days. Rest in every hole and cellar, weeps as might a murderer. I run the rooftops even higher, and I search, where are you? Where? Right? He's looking for God. He's in the ghetto, and he's looking to the rooftops. He's looking for, for, for God wherever he can find God. He's stretching out beyond the rooftops. You can also think about the ways in which poetry and literature enables him to transport himself out of the ghetto, right? Um, and also the way in which these words both take us back in time to the experience of the emotion of what someone like Sutzkever might have been going through and the emotion, the experience um, that we can communicate through these words. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. Um, just talk a little bit about uh, literature created after the war, and then I want to leave time for some, some questions. Um, we talked about materials that are created in the DP camps. We have these, what are called Yiskor books, memorial books. Um, this is an example of one. There's over a thousand of these memorial books, which in some cases became the only types of materials that Jews could create as let's call them literary tombstones, right? Memorial books for towns that were destroyed, where survivors and those who had managed to escape these towns before the war created these literary tombstones, right? To write about what life was like in their town before the war, what happened to the Jews of their town during the war, to create a record through the written word of these places that were destroyed. So this is a place called Vodava, which is not far from Lublin uh, in the southeastern part of Poland. It's close to the, where the Sobibor extermination camp was. And you can see here sort of the imagery that they use to um, memorialize their town through the Iskra book. Um, I mentioned memoirs as an important source that are created after the war. So you can see here um, next to this is a picture that's taken uh, in Buchenwald. Um, right at the time of liberation, basically. And there's Elie Wiesel. Um, and very soon after the war, Wiesel writes his memoir, which is translated into English as uh, Night. Um, and most of you will have encountered it in this way. And um, the, his memoir is, is an incredibly important source for um, both reading about his experiences from deportation from Siget to experiences in Auschwitz, to liberation. Um, but I want to point out that the first version of his memoir is published in Yiddish. And the title, if for those who can read the Yiddish, is not Nacht, not Night. It's called Und die Welt hat geschwiegen, and the world was silent. And the tone of the memoir when it's published after the war in Yiddish, this is from a series that's published in Buenos Aires, um, is much darker 
is much angrier, is much more resentful, is much more disappointed in the silence of the world, right? And this makes us think about what happens in the process of translation. What happens when you're writing for one audience where you can write about your anger, you can write about your rage, you can write about your desire for revenge, right? Um, one of the creators of the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York, Living Memorial to the Holocaust, was a underground courier in the Warsaw Ghetto by the name of Vladka Mead. Fagela Pelta was her name. Her underground name was Vladka. She gets married to Ben Mead. She becomes Vladka Mead. Vladka wrote her both memoir of her experiences as an underground courier um, for the Jewish Fighting Organization. But when she arrived in New York in 1946, Vladka also wrote a series of newspaper articles about what happened in Yiddish, in the Yiddish forwards. Every week there would be an installment from Vladka. Vladka tells her story. And her last installment, which she wrote in November of 1946, she wrote about her anger. She wrote about how disappointed she was in the American Jews. Where were you? How could you be silent while all of this was happening, right? Now, I got to tell you, when it was translated into English and republished, that segment didn't make it into the published memoir, right? Somebody, the editor, somebody, the publisher was like, eh, maybe we should leave that out, right? Maybe that won't sell, right? So you could think about what happens in the process of translation, what happens in the course of time, what gets removed, what memories are softened, what's left out, right? And memory changes over time, depending on language and depending on audience. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead. I, I would just say for memoirs, I highly recommend using Primo Levi's Survival in Auschwitz um, in terms of as a teaching tool for students for to convey the experience of Primo Levi as an Italian Jew who uh, is brought to Auschwitz and survives his last year there. And again, what we started out by talking about, how do you convey the traumatic nature of the experiences? Levy tries to do this to describe what he describes as the demolition of a man, right? The demolition of a human being, right? How do you do this? Um, and he has a poem in the beginning where he says it's a reinterpreted pr Shema prayer, right? You who live in your warm houses, you who find returning evening hot food and friendly faces, consider if this is a man who works in the mud, who does not know peace, who fights for a scrap of bread, who dies because of yes or no. Consider if this is a woman without hair and without name, with no more strength to remember, her eyes empty and her womb cold like a frog in winter. And then he directly reinterprets the Shema, right? Meditate that this came about. I commend these words to you. Carve them in your hearts, right? At home, in the street, going to bed, rising, right? Repeat this Shema prayer in the morning and when you go to bed. Repeat them to your children. Or may your house fall apart. May illness impede you. May your children turn their faces from you, right? This is this this obligation to remember, this obligation to communicate, and this obligation that he enjoins upon us, that we have an obligation to know and to remember that this happened. I, I wish I had more time, <laughs> um, but I also wanna get to people's questions. I'm gonna share this whole um, PowerPoint with you. Um, this is a poem by Don Pagis that I love using in my classes here in this car load. It's called Written in Pencil in a Sealed Train Car. It's incredibly powerful, difficult poem, many layers of meeting. It imagines Eve in a train car with my son Abel. If you see my older boy, Cain, who murdered Abel, right? And it's left cut off. I don't know what to say to him. And there's so many ways to interpret this poem with your students. It's what, I think 19, 20 words, right? You can count it. Um, the original is in Hebrew here. Uh, and it's, this is at the Belzec Memorial and this is the English translation and a Polish translation as well. Um, I apologize that I have so much to say and I didn't get to my 
discussion of contemporary novels, I'm happy to discuss that, or contemporary films, what works, what doesn't work. But um, Amanda, I'll cut myself off here so you can okay. uh, have enough time, and I'm happy to take some questions. Sure. So um, one of the questions that we already got was about um, contemporary novels, and one that has come up a couple of times is um, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Mm. Um, and, you know, what are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on some of the novels that exist? And are there any that you recommend that you think are particularly historically accurate and good to use with students? Okay, great. Um, good. I'm glad I cut myself off because um, I wouldn't <laughs> forgive myself if I didn't talk about the boy in the striped pajamas. Um, <laughs> so uh, what I'm going to say, and I'm actually going to leave my um, PowerPoint open for, for a minute so I can scroll down. But I'll just show you. Um, so I don't know if you can see this. This is a, a book called Understanding and Teaching the Holocaust. Um, this is in my shameless self-promotion component of the talk. So this is a, a book that I've just co-edited um, called Understanding and Teaching the Holocaust. And uh, we have a chapter in here, and I mentioned this. We have a chapter in here by my colleague at the University of Connecticut, Alan Marcus, who has spoken at workshop, Museum of Jewish Heritage workshops before. And Alan has a chapter in the volume on teaching the Holocaust through film. And he said, I need to spend at least half the chapter explaining to teachers why they should never ever use the boy in the striped pajamas, <laughs> both, as a, both as a book and um, as a film. Um, in short, and I would highly recommend, Alan has written about, written about this. You can probably Google it and find it online, his sort of explanations about why it's dangerous to use the boy in the striped pajamas. I would just say that there's a, many, many historical inaccuracies. It's very problematic from a historical standpoint. Um, it, it sort of invents scenarios that never could have happened. And then you have to think about why does it invent scenarios that try to imagine sort of a, a German boy who's substituted and um, murdered in a gas chamber, right? What is it trying to do? What's the purpose of that? How is it trying to sort of um, atone for some sense of guilt? Um, and it, so it just, it's bad as a teaching tool. It's misleading. It's historically inaccurate. Um, and it's dubious in terms of like what the intent of the volume of the book is. Um, I, so there was a question about like novels that work. Um, mm -hmm. So I, this one I think is very confusing for students. Everything is illuminated. Um, so I don't recommend using it unless you're like, you know, with a sophisticated college class, the movie's actually okay. Um, this is also confusing the history of love. Um, I just want to mention The Pawnbroker, which is one of the earliest American novels to deal with the subject of the Holocaust, written with very little knowledge of what happened during the war. But it's a fascinating novel where Wallant is trying to imagine from the perspective of Saul Naserman what it's like to be somebody living in New York. He lives in Harlem, um, running a pawn shop and carrying the burdens of the war. I'm not sure if it would work with students, but I recommend it as something to read um, at, for teachers, deeply thought provoking. Sorry, no shave on, again, historical invention. Um, I'm just gonna mention a couple like and I have a section of the talk about archive fever. There have been a lot of books that have engaged in meticulous historical research that are really, really well done, that basically create sort of a framework based in history and then put the fictional characters in this historical framework. And these are the ones that I really like to recommend. So. Um, people have pro most people are probably not familiar with this. I love this novel by Sarah Hodling, Pictures at an Exhibition. It's about a fam it's a novel, it's completely fictionalized. It's, a, it's about a family of French art collectors, Jewish art collectors, who lose their um, entire collection during the war, about a son and a father. And um, she's a great writer, very well done. Um, Julie Oranger, if people are familiar with Julie Oranger's work, I think she's excellent. Um, she, again, is somebody who, it takes her like eight years to write a novel because she does meticulous historical research. And then she writes beautifully, um, you know, sort of the emotion, the experiences of the, her characters. Her first novel is called The Invisible Bridge. It uh, details the experiences of Jews drafted into the Hungarian forced labor battalions. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, it's 
takes place across the continent. And I don't want to give away too much. She also has a new novel called The Flight Portfolio that um, looks at Varian Fry and his rescue efforts um, during the war. So those are those are two that I that I recommend. And I also had a, a short story here by Molly Antipole um, in a collection called The Un-Americans. Um, not to be confused with the, the show that was on TV. This is The Un-Americans. Um, she has a story called the Stories My Grandmother Tells Me in that collection um, that uh, is about a girl interviewing her grandmother who fought with the partisans. And it's really, really well done. It's a great short story. I love using short stories. Um, I'll recommend also, and this is just one question, but I do want to mention a great Guatemalan Jewish writer by the name of um, Eduardo Chalfon. So this is a collection that he has called Morning. Um, and he's got a series of three, uh, you know, short story collections that have been translated into English. So actually, the first one is The Polish Boxer. The second one is Monastery. And the third is Morning. And he writes, he lives in America, but he writes in Spanish. He's born in Guatemala. And what he does amazingly well is he writes about intergenerational transmission of memory, what it's like to be the grandchild of a survivor trying to uncover his grandfather's experiences in Auschwitz while growing up as a Jewish boy living in Guatemala. It's really, really well done. So Eduardo Chalfon. Great. Um, some people are also asking about your thoughts on the book Thief, which is another popular YA book that some teachers like to use. Is that one considered historically accurate or would you avoid that one as well? Yeah, I don't. So my my 15 year old daughter is still sleeping. Um, and uh, <laughs> she was she was just reading the book Thief. I, I will confess I haven't read it. So I can't. Um, but if Maya were here, I'd bring her down and she could comment for the group. <laughs> okay. Um, and just teachers, just so you know, we also will um, talk about other resources to use with students. We have a bibliography as well of historian approved sources in addition to the ones just mentioned. Um, and um, Professor, if it's okay with you, we can actually go a little bit long because the next session is me. So I'm happy to shorten my session so we can continue this discussion. Um, fine with me. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so um, there's another question about um, archives like the Oneg Shabbos archive. Um, do we, is there still a search for more of that? Do we know of any other archives in other ghettos that were similar to that? Okay, great question. Um, I'm going to scroll back up. This is why I left the PowerPoint uh, up. Okay, so just to answer the question about the Oneg Shabbos, um, and I literally just last night, um, we hosted a lecture here in, in Hartford, a virtual lecture by Sam Cassow, and he was just talking about um, this issue. So um, there's a couple of challenges with finding, there's definitely more material underground in Warsaw. Um, the problem is that um, the Warsaw ghetto was, Warsaw itself was completely, completely destroyed. I mean, you just have to think of piles and piles of rubble. Um, and trying to find where anything was. So um, Sam showed a picture last night of, in his lecture, one of the last remaining features in Warsaw was this large church steeple that was not destroyed. And so survivors from the ghetto who had been part of the Onyx Shabbos archive were able to use that as kind of like a geographic locator and say, okay, I because note the streets were gone, like they didn't know where any addresses were. And yet over the course of so in 1946, they found that first trove of, of metal boxes. Um, in 1950, there was a construction project that was taking place um, and they were digging, you know, the construction team was digging in the, in the site of the ghetto and they found another trove. Um, there is, if you look on this map, uh, I don't think you can see it here, but there's a Svintarska street um, and um, there, was a trove that was buried there. Um, the problem is that right now the Chinese embassy is at that address. Um, and so uh, there's speculation that there's probably something buried under the Chinese embassy, but that's gonna be a, a tough uh, challenge to uncover. Um, I, 
I was supposed to be, so I told Amanda, Amanda that I wasn't going to be, initially I wasn't going to be here for this workshop, what, you know, when we talked about it six months ago, because I was supposed to be in Warsaw this week, um, uh, and I was going to be there with a team of um, geophysicists and archaeologists who are interested in mapping the subsurface to look for those kinds of things. So, um, yeah, I think that there is still material that's buried underground, and um, there's important archaeological work that can take place to uncover these materials. Now, whether stuff has survived is a whole different question, right? Like you think about water damage and you think about things that are written on paper and um, it's not like writing on stone tablets, which survives 2000 years. Yeah. Um, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Melkans themselves are kept in Warsaw, the Jewish Historical Institute. Correct. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, so um, if anyone is ever in Warsaw, um, which I don't know how many of you have that in your travel plans, but um, they do have those. Um, yeah, we'll all also get back to traveling soon. Yeah, yeah hopefully, yes. Um, there's also a question about if there are specific films that you think are good to use with students that are engaging and accurate. Great, so I'm going to scroll down to my... Um, film section. Okay. Um, so again, um, I would highly recommend um, Alan Marcus um, on this topic. And Alan has this chapter on teaching the Holocaust with film. And in this chapter on teaching the Holocaust with film, um, and he calls this, uh, his chapter, the gray zone of Holocaust education, right? Sort of a play on, on words. But um, he has a list in here of about 30 films that he says he would consider Holocaust feature films to consider using with, with students. Um, and you can see here that I include a few of them on, on my list. Um, now, every film that you, know, you talk about is gonna make certain choices in terms of um, translating you know, historical events into a feature film. We have to know that, right? Like, and, and I think it's important to communicate that to our students that there are certain pluses and minuses. It's, it's not history, it's not fact, it's fiction, right? Anything that is rendered in film is fictionalized. Um, Schindler's List, you know, for those of you who remember the Seinfeld episode where Jerry, you know, Jerry, you were making out during Schindler's List, right? There, there's, they're, like the point that they're trying to make is that none of this is sacred in some sense, right? It's still a movie. But that being said, right, there are some that are done better than others. Um, I have here in the middle of this slide, The Pianist, um, which is uh, the, the Roman Polanski and Polanski, as we know, has all sorts of his own issues, but um, as, an, as sort of a, a work of art, I think the, the, the Pianist does an excellent, excellent job of taking a memoir of Władysław Spielmann and translating it into film. He was meticulous, Polanski, in trying to recreate using as much historical fact as he could at the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, and I think it's, it's very, very well done. It also is sensitive to communicating the experiences of the individual, right? Spielman's experiences, and also an awareness that it's just one individual's experiences that are communicated. Um, Schindler's List, right, um, at the time was greatly celebrated. Um, it's still a very important film. It's incredibly useful to use with students. I would, there are great materials online that encourage you to think critically about, you know, why Spielberg was invested in kind of um, presenting Oscar Schindler as a type of a savior, right? Um, you can ask your students, you could, I, what I would say is you could use any film, you just want your students to think critically about it, right? Um, you know, what is the, how much agency do Jews have in this film as compared to Schindler? Is Schindler the one who's motivating everything? Do Jews have any of their own agency? Defiance is, is another example that um, I like to point out. So Defiance, I think is a great tool to teach about the Bielski brothers. Um, it has to be coupled with uh, the historical background on the Bielski brothers. I would do that first. Teach about the Bielski brothers, do the historical background on who were the actual Bielski brothers, how they were incredibly motivated to save human lives and avoid conflict in any way they could, what they did to save 
you know, 1,200 Jews in, the, in a family camp in the forest. And then the choices that the filmmakers make in order to make this a Hollywood blockbuster, right? What happens when you put, you know, James Bond, Daniel Craig, as, um, as Tuvia Bielski? What happens when you put Liev Schreiber, who I think is a great actor, as Zeus, right? Like there's certain choices that are made and you can ask your students to think critically, like, you know, what's the pluses and minuses of doing this through film? Um, Alan also highly recommends Europa Europa, um, which I think is, is excellent. Um, and like I said, another list of 30 films that, uh, that do a good job, yeah. Um, and I just wanna remind everyone, as we mentioned yesterday, um, the Jewish Partisan Educational Foundation actually has a curriculum that goes along with Defiance. Um, so they'll, they have all of the historical context for teaching using that movie. Um, and I do want to caution with Europa Europa, I would preview that film first because there are a couple of scenes that are graphic and not appropriate for like a high school or middle school classroom. Right. Um, so defi definitely preview before, before just showing the whole film. Um, I'll, just, I'll just say that one of the things, um, I know exactly what you're talking about, and I think you're 100% right. And I'm glad you mentioned that with a film like Europa Europa, there are things that you have to think about in a, in a school classroom. Um, one of the things that's, that's difficult to talk about, so th this has to do with circumcision, right? And, um, and the sort of very identifiable marker of a Jewish male. And what's interesting, and it's a really hard thing to talk about with students, but also really important to talk about, right? Like sort of um, that, you know, the, the Solomon Peril in the film, he knows that circumcision is what's gonna identify him as a Jewish male. At the same time, I often like to point out that you know, when we look at women and the experiences of women, why do women play such an important role in the Jewish underground as couriers sneaking between ghettos? It's because they couldn't be easily identified um, as, as Jews, right? Because of circumcision. Right. Um, someone is also mentioning that there are parts of defiance not okay for middle school. Um, again, what's nice about the JPEF curriculum is they have like I think they have permission to have specific scenes and you can request a DVD through them of just the scenes that are good for educational purposes. So I think it cuts out any of the stuff that might not be as appropriate. But again, you know, use your judgment. You all know your students best. Um, um, there's a I, sorry, I'll just mention one other thing. Um, so uh, two films that I think might work for a younger audience. Um, there's a recent there's a film, uh, I think it's called, it's actually based on, um, I have the book here, but I'll send you the link. I think it was also called in English, A Bag of Marbles. Um, it's based on a memoir of a, of a survivor from France. Um, and it's, it's sort of made with, a, with an eye to the experiences of children. And I think it does a good job of that. Run Boy Run is also another one that um, I think is a little more sensitive to Sort of a younger audience too, um, but but one of the challenges is if it's not in English, um, sort of you know your students are going to have to read subtitles. Right. Um, there's also um, I want to mention, and I mentioned this on the first day of the course, uh, the HBO film The Number on Great Grandpa's Arm, which oh, yeah. is specifically designed for younger students, and we have lesson plans to accompany that. Um, so if you're teaching third through like let's say sixth or seventh grade and looking for a film that's historically accurate but appropriate, that one is a great resource to check out. Um, there's also a question about mouse and your thoughts on that and using that with students. Okay, <laughs> this is great. All the things that I didn't get to in my presentation <laughs> um, are coming up in the, in the Q&A. So I'll go to my mouse slide and I apologize. I sort of, um, I always do this. I have so much I wanna talk about and there's only you know, so much time. Um, so mouse, um, I do like using with my students. Um, of course, you know, I'm, I'm working in a college classroom, so it's a different, I think high school, um, it can work in a high school classroom. What I think is incredible about using mouse, and I have this um, sort of one slide uh, that is actually from on the left, the one that starts time flies, that's from Mouse 2, the, the second um, edition, the second volume, I should say, that, that's published. Um, 
what he's able to do through the graphic novel, and I think graphic novels really resonate with our students, as we all know for many reasons, they, they like reading graphic novels, they get it, it's a genre that they can relate to, um, is that he's able to sort of transcend the two-dimensional nature of the written page um, through the use of art and words. Um, and so, you know, all the simple things that he does in the graphic novel, um, like the plays on words that he uses, so time flies, you know, Vladek died of congestive heart failure on August 18th, 1982. Francois and I stayed with him in the Catskills back in August 1979, right? Anything that is written by Art himself, um, you can see he writes in lowercase letters elsewhere in the graphic novel. Anything that's written by Vladek, he writes by his father, he writes in all caps. Um, the flies is a play on words. We don't know where the flies are coming from in the first one, but we can see that he's reflecting on the idea that is he profiting off the death of millions of Jews, right? Or in this case, the millions of mice, the bodies, it's always there with him, right? Um, he reflects on the mouse mask that he puts on when he goes to work, you know, and this becomes his job, writing this, illustrating this. Um, and it, I think it's interesting for students to think about, you know, now we think about masks in a completely different way. It's just as I'm talking about, I'm thinking about this, but to think about the masks that we put on and what they say about us. And I think he illustrates for us in a very nice way, like when I go to this place, when I go to the place of thinking about my father, of thinking about his experiences, this is the mask that I that I put on. And he illustrates it. So there's just this one page. This is why I recommend it, because just this one page, there is so much to unpack and analyze um, that students will be able to, to find and uncover that works really well. Um, and I just also want to point out, this is less for students, more for you as teachers. Um, Art Spiegelman also wrote Meta Mouse, which is kind of um, a look at how his process for writing mouse and all, um, all of that went into it. So if you're interested in learning more about that. Um, yeah, and with Meta Mouse, there's a, what seems very old school now, but a DVD-ROM um, yes. that, <laughs> where you can listen to the audio recordings that he took of his father giving testimony and then you can hear it and then you can see how he rendered that testimony in the graphic novel. Right. Um, there was also a question, we're getting a lot of questions about your thoughts on different movies and um, books, but um, Jojo Rabbit, which came out huh. recently. Um, any okay. thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, so that's, this is a whole, this is a whole other session. <laughs> um, I'm gonna just, again, I'm not, I'm not a big self promoter, but it's, it's gonna seem like it. Um, so I got another another book that just came out um, in April that I co-edited called Laughter After, Humor and the Holocaust. So I have a lot of thoughts about, you know, humor and uses of humor and the appropriate and inappropriate uses of humor. Um, Jojo Rabbit um, is, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a whole genre of films that use comedy um, in the context of the Holocaust. I don't, I didn't think Jojo Rabbit was was great in that genre, um, to be honest with you. I think, you know, I mean, it, it falls in the genre of, of uh, films that use humor as a weapon. Um, I'm gonna tell you why I didn't think it was great though. It's, I have no problems with like using humor as a weapon, using humor to um, attack Nazis, using humor to make fun of Hitler. There's a lot of films and, you know, works of literature that do that quite well and I'm all for it. Um, and it's a, you know, Mel Brooks would often say that his key dividing line in terms of using humor in the context of the Holocaust was he had no problem using humor as a weapon to attack Nazis. Um, he thought that that was a great use of humor. It's a, it's a sort of one of the weapons that Jews, a powerless people would have at their disposal. They could always maintain their wit. And so he felt like that was an appropriate use of humor. Um, but uh, Mel Brooks would say, I, I would never use humor to make light of Jewish suffering. Um, and Jojo Rabbit, actually, the problem that I had with it as a movie, and this is, you know, the sort of, this is not my area of expertise, but I actually thought like as, as a, it was a genre, it was confused about what genre of film it wanted to be. Was it a comedy or was it a drama? Um, and uh, it was just a little bit of a mishmash in that sense. So anyway, that's my two cents. Okay. 
um, I do want to point out um, for those of you who are considering maybe using it, the USC Shoah Foundation does have a curriculum through their eyewitness um, online tool, which is um, something they use for visual history and testimony about how to use it to teach about propaganda. So if you wanted to, if teachers are interested in using it in that specific way, they do have resources for how to use it in that sense um, and how to use specific segments to teach specifically about um, its messages on propaganda. Um, just in case that's something you're, anyone is interested in taking a look at. Um, I think let's do one more question before we wrap up. Let me just look through and see what came in while we were chatting. Um, um, oh, our, so you mentioned earlier about um, Ellie Wiesel's original text being much angrier than the eventual English translation that came out of Night. Are there any more accurate translations of either his memoir or other memoirs that capture that anger and immediacy in a way that the more well-known translations do not? Yeah, interesting question. Um, so there's the, I'll just mention for somebody, if anyone's really interested in this topic, there's a great article um, that was published in Jewish Social Studies by uh, Naomi Seidman, um, and it's called Ellie Wiesel and the Scandal of Jewish Rage, Seidman, S-E-I-D-M-A-N. And she's one of the few people who's gone through and like line by line compared the original Yiddish version with the, um, with the English translation. And um, what's, so there is no, and I, I don't know what the sort of publishing issues are around us, but as far as I know, there is no like, Anne Frank's diary was, was published and then republished and then republished and it's now, there is like an authoritative annotated edition of Anne Frank's diary that has everything in it and they find new things and they put it in and, and that hasn't happened um, with Knight. And I think, you know, there's a number of, of issues involved with it. I think for Elie Wiesel, um, time, you know, performs important functions and you can read the original version that's published after the war and you get this sort of immediacy. And that, so there is no, translation of this, it's like an 800 page, which is also incredible to think about. It's like an 800 page Yiddish memoir. Um, and I think you might be able to access it. Um, I think it's been scanned and digitized. I mean, I don't know how many Yiddish readers there are there, but it's been scanned and digitized by the Yiddish Book Center and you might be able to access it through their library online. Um, but uh, there is, as far as I know, there's no translation of that 800 page version, which would be an amazing project somebody should take on if they have the time. Um, but it, it's, I would start with that article by, um, by Naomi, who also finds really interesting things that, so, you know, it, it's first published in French and then it's translated from French into English. And in each subsequent translation, it kind of gets, you know, the tone shifts over time. And I think Fizel, his English was perfect. He, you know, his thoughts and his approach changed over time also. And so that's the prerogative of the memoirist too, right? Where you think about your audience and you think about what is the message that I want to convey to them. And I think this is a, a good point for us to think about, like at the very end, um, a memoir is both an accounting of one's experiences, but the process of writing a memoir, you cannot write every single thing. Even survivor testimony, you can't recount every single thing. There are certain things that are going to stand out instead of others. There are certain things that you choose to share with your audience that you're not going to share with another audience. There are certain things that, like if you write this in Yiddish for an audience of survivors, there are certain things that you're going to say to an audience of fellow Jewish survivors that they will understand, that they will get, that a general audience just would never understand. And so that goes back to the original challenge of language. Like, how do you communicate it? What do you share? What are the memories that, you know, are private memories? There are memories that survivors never, ever shared with anyone. Things that happened that they just would never share, not with their spouses, not with their children, 
not with their closest friends. And then there's like the public memory that becomes like, this is the testimony that I will give in front of a, a classroom, right? And so there's a wide space in between those two. And, and I think you can see it with this memoir as well. Great. Um, well, I think unfortunately we do need to end there for today. So I wanna thank uh, Professor Pat for joining us and for all of this information. Um, 